Hello, this. Hello. Namaste. Namaste. Hello. Good evening to all. Pleasure in meeting you all today at this great program. Thank you all the best for the today's CME event, CPD. Okay, welcome. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Mohammed uh, Abdel Ghani of the Vice President of the Palestinian Association of Medical Radiation Technologists. Hello? <laughs> okay. Uh, the next one is the, uh, Mr. Kaju Ego Ueda from the President of the um, Japan Association of Radiologic Technologists. Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome. Hello. Okay, now I invite uh, Hong Kong Radiographers Association Chairman, uh, Mr. Nelson Wentz, for the opening speech. Welcome, Mr. Nelson. Thank you, Mr. M. On behalf of Hong Kong Radiographers Association, and thank you to each and every one of you for being here with us this evening. I'm also delighted to welcome all of the members from different Asian radiological technologies society um, for this 28th Asian CPD program. And we do uh, have a, today's uh, topic is uh, smart radiology and we have four different topics and we, we do all your enjoy the lectures this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Now we start today Asia City CPT program. The main theme of today's Asia City CPT program is smart radiology. This is the hot topic in recent years. We are great to invite four speakers for, for today's topics. Please enjoy it. Let me introduce the first speaker, Dr. Chris Ma from Bayer Healthcare Limited. Dr. Ma currently is a regional medical need Asian Pacific of radiology in Bayer company. He has a rich experience in medical affairs such as liver, hepatitis, and heart failure. He received both bachelor and master degree in National Yangming University from the Department of Biomedical Imaging and Radiological Science and Institute of the biopharmaceutical science respectively. He received a PhD in molecular medicine in Academy, Seneca and National Yangming University. Today, his presentation topic is updated ACR guidelines and evidence on conscious safety. Welcome and give a pause to Dr. Ma. Thank you for the very kind introduction. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is very honored to be the speaker in this very successful and wonderful meeting. My name is Chris. I'm the regional medical lead from Bayer APAC Radiology. And this is my disclaimer. So today I will uh, introduce the updated information in ACR guideline on contrast media from 2021 and 2023. And I will discuss some uh, common questions regarding the safety of contrast media in clinical practice. Uh, and all the answers and uh, recommendations are based on guideline recommendations and published evidence. So first of all, this is the summaries of overall updates in ACR from 2021 to this year. In 2021, there are three uh, chapters update, including chapter five for fasting and chapter 10 for uh, post-contrast acute kidney injury and chapter 16 for uh, nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. And in 2022, uh, two main chapters update are in the astrophysicians and also in the pregnancy screening statement for gadolinium-based contrast agents. For this year, the main updates is in nephrogenic systemic fibrosis regarding the EGFR calculations for the adults patients. So I will go into more detailed information for each update. First of all is the uh, fasting update in 2021. Previously, some practice will request patient to fast before the uh, intravascular uh, contrast media administration to reduce the possibility 
of uh, vomiting, nausea, and aspiration pneumonia. However, the modern contrast media for CT and MRI have much lower risk of vomiting compared to the contrast media used uh, previously. And also, based on the evidence, uh, there is no case of uh, aspiration is attributable to, uh, to the contrast media used uh, recently. And also, there is no preventive effect of uh, prefasting on the risk of uh, vomiting and also nausea and aspiration. So based on the evidence, it is the first time in 2021 that ACR guideline include a new chapter for fasting and also recommended that it is not required before the routine intravenous uh, contrast media administration. And the next update in 2021 is in chapter 10 regarding the terminology alteration. So uh, first of all is the terminology alteration for contrast associated acute kidney injury. Previously, it is uh, used as post-contrast acute kidney uh, injury, and now it is changed to uh, contrast-associated acute kidney injury, which may occur regardless of whether the contrast media was the cause of renal function deterioration. So it's a correlative diagnosis. And for the contrast-induced nephropathy, it was changed to contrast-induced uh, acute kidney injuries which describe a certain renal function deterioration due to the contrast media administration. So it's a causative diagnosis terms. And the chapter title in chapter 10 was also changed accordingly. And another update in this chapter in that year is the indication and protocol of volume expansion, which is the major preventive action to mitigate the risk of contra-associated acute kidney injury. And in 2021, the ACR guideline uh, includes the indication for volume expansion that it is indicated in patients with uh, acute kidney injury and also in patients with severe kidney disease. And for patients with border EGF, uh, EGFR value around 30 to 44 milliliter per minute, if the patients are in the high risk situation, then the volume expansion may be considered based on the prescriber's decisions and monitored. And also for the protocol, uh, there's more specific information in the 2021 version. For the recommended fluid, it is recommended to use the isotonic uh, fluid such as 0.9% normal saline. And for the protocol, it is recommended to initiate one hour before the contrast uh, positions and continue three to 12 hours after the exam. And for the dose, it may be used uh, fixed volume or weight-based uh, volume with one to three milliliter per kilogram per hour. And for the statement of uh, oral hydration, it is changed that it is not well studied in patient with EGFR less than 30, and also in patient with acute kidney injury. And regarding the pre uh, medical prevention of contrast associated acute kidney injury, for the use of, for the use of uh, sodium, uh, uh, sorry, for the use of n acetylcysteine in 2021, it is changed to a more concrete uh, recommendation that it is not recommended due to its uh, no, not effective compared to placebo. And also for the sodium bicarbonate, it is not preferred because the efficacy is similar to the normal saline, but it requires additional compounding from the pharmacist. And the final update in this chapter is regarding the renal dialysis patient and the use of iodine contrast media. So previously, uh, uh, urgent dialysis is only suggested in patients receiving large volume of contrast or patient with a uh, substantial underlying uh, cardiac dysfunction. However, there is no convincing evidence demonstrating the benefit of propylated uh, dialysis on the renal function. So in 2021, there are main update, two main updates in this session. First of all, is for patients on dialysis, but making urine around one hour, one, 100 milliliter per day. For this patient, they should be treated as high-risk patient and consider non-aneuric to avoid convincing oligonuric patients to aneuric patients. And the second uh, update is that uh, acute renal dialysis and renal replacement therapy should not be initiated solely because of iodine contrast uh, median administration because of the risk, cost, and also lack of proven benefit. And the final update in 2021 is regarding the chapter of nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. 
for the outpatient who may receiving group one or group three uh, gadolinium based contrast agents, they should be screened for factors that may be associated with renal function impairment. So in 2021, the ACR guideline modified the list of risk factor for identifying the patient with possible renal insufficiency. For the history of renal disease, the history CKD or AKI is included, and hypertension is removed due to large uh, false, po false positive rate, and diabetes is set as uh, optional risk factors. And in, in the meantime, for patients with ESRD on coronary dialysis, there is an additional and specific statement uh, update from ACR with National Kidney Foundation in 2021 version that in patients who are already on dialysis performing GBCA enhanced MRI before dialysis if clinically feasible. And also dialysis should not be initiated and rescheduled in patient receiving group two agents due to very low risk of nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. And next I'll going to introduce the update in 2022. The first one is the extravasations of contrast media. So in 2022, uh, 2022 version in this chapter of extravasation, there is an updated recommendation with the strengths of evidence provided. And overall, the focus on the cost of extravasation in terms of iodine contrast media has shifted to the viscosity, meaning that the frequency is more common in patients receiving more uh, viscous contrast media. And also several recommendations were made to minimize the risk, including uh, using angel catheter rather than butterfly needles, performing meticulous intravenous uh, catheter insertion, and carefully securing and inserted catheters. And also there is a note for the central venous catheters and PICC that these catheters should be certified and also provide the uh, flow rate limit information if they are used for the power injection of contrast media. And finally, in the 2022, there is a Q&A format in this extravasation chapter to discuss the very crucial questions regarding extravasation, including how to minimize the risk and also how to manage when it is happened. And the next update in 2022 is regarding the gadolinium pregnancy screening statement. Because a retrospective study uh, uh, notify a risk of mortality and adverse events, in the offspring after GBCA exposure during their pregnancy. So uh, the ACR committee recommends to avoid routine administration of GBCA to the pregnant patients unless there is a significant clinical benefit that outweighs the unknown risk. And also they remind that a hospital should uh, include a more vigilant screening protocol as there is a study noticed an increased prevalence of gadolinium-based contrast agent administration during the first trimester. And women uh, with childbearing age should also be informed regarding the risk of fetal GBCA exposure. And finally, for this year, the only update is in the EGFR calculation that race is no longer uh, exists in the equation, only creatinine, age, and sex uh, in, are in the calculation. And next, let's we'll discuss some common questions in patient uh, uh, in in, in practice using a question and answer format. So first of all is what is the consideration for patient with risk of adverse reaction as there are several factors uh, are identified for the adverse reaction after contrast exposure. In guidelines, several strategies are recommended to minimize the risk. First of all is the uh, pre-medications. In this part, oral pre-medications is preferable to IV route in most of the settings. And although the efficacy duration is unknown, most of the study demonstrating that the efficacy duration of five to four hours, four to five hours is, uh, might be efficacious. And also there is no evidence supporting the duration of less than two hours currently. And the additional uh, administration of antihistamine may help reduce several uh, symptoms. And regarding the patients with previous uh, allergic like or unknown type of contrast reaction, it may recommend it to change the contrast media with the same class, which may help reduce the possibility of subsequent contrast reactions. 
And for the pre-testing, uh, for the intradermal skin testing or testing injection, it is not recommended because it has not been shown to be useful in minimizing the reaction risk. And next, let's delve into the uh, more specific recommendation from guideline regarding the premedications. First of all, is the indications. So for the indications of uh, 12 to 13 hours premedication by oral, uh, it is indicated in all patients and in patients with non-history of allergic light or unknown type contrast reaction. And for the inpatient, it should be noted that the use of oral premedication should not delay the patient diagnosis and also the patient treatment. And for the accelerated IV premedication, it is indicated for our patient with also with non-allergic light history, but it has not been premedicated and the schedule cannot be easily rescheduled. And for inpatient, the accelerated IV premedication can be considered when the oral premedication is anticipated to uh, delay the patient care and, or delay the patient treatment. And regarding the specific regimen for the premedication, for oral premedication, it is basically corticosteroid plus antihistamine. For the corticosteroid, there are two regimens mentioned in the ACR guideline. The first one is prednisone based at a dose of 50 milligram by mouse at 13 hours, seven hours, and one hour before contra exposure, and then with uh, antihistamine one hour before the contra administration. And for the methylprednisone base at a dose of 32 milligram by mouse at 12 hours and two hours before the exams, and also with antihistamine optional in one hour before the contrast exposure. And if the patient cannot take any oral medication, then for the first option, it may be replaced with 200 milligram hydrocortisone IV for each dose of uh, oral prednisone. And although there is no study formally compare these two regimens, they are considered equally effective in the guideline. And for the regimen of accelerated IV premedication, uh, there are three regimens mentioned in the ACR guideline in the decreasing order of preference. So the first preferred uh, regimen for IV premedication is methylprednisone or hydrocortisone, injected immediately and then every four hours and also with antihistamine one hour before the contra exposure. The second regimen is desamethasone, which may also be helpful if the patient is allergic to the first option, and the dosing duration and also the usage of antihistamine is similar to the first option. And the next option is uh, methylprednisone and hydrocortisone, and also antihistamine, but one hour before contrast agent, but please note that this regimen is actually not evidence-based and should only be considered in an emergent situation with no other options. So next, I would like to discuss the renal safety of iodine contrast media. And first of all, because in guideline, it is not recommended to acquire the renal function information before intravenous iodine contrast media for all the patients. So which factor might, can be used to identify the patient may uh, warrant further renal function assessment? So according to the ACR guideline, according to the ACR guideline, there are several risk factors, including personal history of renal disease, including non-chronic kidney disease and uh, a history of acute kidney injury, dialysis, patient receiving kidney surgery, and patient receiving ablation, or patient with albinuria. And the diabetes is an optional factor. And another risk factor is diabetes patients uh, receiving metformin or metformin containing drug combinations. And how about for patients with baseline medications? It is necessary to withhold certain medications to further decrease the risk of kidney injuries. So the recommendation from guideline is actually based on the patient's renal function that in patient with AKI or EGFR less than 30, then it may be sensible to withhold some non-essential but potentially nephrotoxic medications for 24 to 48 hours and continue to be withheld for 48 hours after the exposure. But if the contrast-associated acute kidney injury already developed, then this non-essential medication should be continue to be withheld until the kidney function has recovered. Another question about the baseline medication is metformin. 
Why the patient need to start metformin before they receive the contrast media? So first of all, we should know that metformin doesn't really increase the risk of post-contrast acute kidney injury. And the most significant adverse event of metformin is the development of uh, metformin-associated lactic, lactic acidosis. Because metformin is also excreted by kidney, so the renal insufficiency is the major consideration for the risk of increasing blood lactate levels due to decreased metformin excretion. So the recommendation regarding the patient taking metformin should be based on the renal function, and it is separated into two categories in ACR guideline. The first category is patient with no evidence of acute kidney injury and uh, with EGFR higher than 30 milliliter per minute. For this patient, there is no need to discontinue metformin at the time and before and after the contrast media exposure. And for the category two, in patient with acute kidney injury or have a severe chronic kidney disease, this patient, because there is potential concern of increasing blood lactate due to further renal function worsening. So it is recommended to stop metformin before or at the time of the procedure and continue to withheld for 48 hours after the contrast uh, administrations. And patient can reinitiate the metformin after the renal function has been evaluated and found to be normal. The final common question is how about the patient need the respite scan? How long should two injections be apart? So from the European contrast guideline, it is based on the patient's baseline renal function as well. For patient with EGFR higher than 30 milliliter per minute, it is recommended uh, that the time between two injections be four hours apart for both ICM and GBCA's injection. And also for patients requiring to receive the ICM and GBCA at the same day. And for patients with EGFR less than 30 or patient on dialysis, it is recommended to be 48 hours apart for ICM and for seven days apart for GBCA and seven days apart for patients who need iodine contrast media and also the gadolinium-based contrast agents. So the final question I want to discuss on the renal safety regarding the iodine contrast media is the comparison between low osmolar contrast media and iso osmolar contrast media. Currently in practice, the most commonly used is non-ionic contrast media. And there are several brands in the non-ionic low osmolar contrast media, but there are only one brand, Eodexanol, which is Visipac, in the non-ionic iso osmolar contrast media. And although there is another low osmolar contrast media, Eosaglate, but because it is ionic, so it only exists in fuel market currently. And there are some debates regarding this comparison with some histories. In 2007, the American uh, PCI guideline for the CKD patient receiving angiography, there is a recommendation preferring ISO or smaller contrast media based on the previous evidence. However, if you look at the further reference in the guideline for the previous studies comparing ISO or smaller contrast media and low or smaller contrast media on renal safety, most of the low or smaller contrast media used in the studies are eosaglate or another low or small contrast media, EOHEXO, which is OMIPEC. But there are more and more clinical studies comparing different low or small contrast media with EODEXNOS. So this table lists the studies comparing EOPROMIDE, the ultravis, versus EODEXNO in both intra-arterial or intravenous administration. And the enrolled patients are with different ranges of renal function, and the CIN definition used in the studies are similar. So for the results on the right panel, you can see most of the studies demonstrate that there's no significant difference regarding the risk of contrast-induced nephropathy between uh, eodexanol and eoprotamide. And also there are three large-scale meta-analyses in 2009 and 2010, also comparing eodexanol with different low or small contrast agents on the incidence of contrast-induced nephropathy. So for this studies, enrolling patients receiving different low or smaller contrast agents, the results all show that there is no difference between eodexanol with NLOCM except for eohexo and eosaglate, which the CIN risk is, compared, um, is, is higher compared to eodexanol.
And I might have more of your attention in the study of four meta analysis in 2010. If we further look at the uh, subgroup analysis table, we can see if the comparison is made between EO Dexno and EO Hexo, then the CIM risk is significantly higher in patients receiving EO, De EO Hexo. But if the authors compare the uh, CIM risk between EO Dexno versus other low osmolar contrast agents, then the CIM risks are comparable between these two, type two types of contrast. So based on the increasing evidence from 2009, the American PCR guideline recommended both iso-osmolar contrast agent and low osmolar contrast agent, except eohexo and eosaglate are indicated in patients with chronic kidney disease undergoing angiography. And furthermore, in 2011, the recommendation preferring iso-osmolar contrast agent was completely deleted from the guideline. So in the updated contrast media or cardiovascular guideline from United States and Europe, the recommendations on the choice of IODNA contrast media do not state any preference between iso-osmolar contrast agent and low osmolar contrast agent regarding the renal safety. And how about in some uh, high-risk populations, such as patients with diabetes? Is there a difference between uh, these two types of contrast on the renal safety? So there is a meta-analysis in 2018 analyzing the patient with diabetes and receive different contrast media. And in total, there are 12 studies with total around 3,000 patients were included. And patients receiving low osmolar contrast agent were given eohexo, eopamido, eoprotmide, eoverso, as well as the ionic dimer eosaclate. And similar to the previous results, in the upper panel, you can see the risk of contrast-induced nephropathy is only significantly higher if the comparison is made between eodexno and eohexo. And in the lower panel, if the comparison is made between eodexno with eoprotmide, then the CIM risk is actually comparable. And finally, I would like to share a recent update for this topic regarding the renal safety of low osmolar contrast media versus iso osmolar contrast media. So it's a propended score study from Korea to compare the contra-induced acute kidney injury risk between these two types of contrast in 2022. And in this study, the also enrolled patient receiving a coronary angiography and PCI and the contrast used for low osmolar contrast agents are eoprotmide and eopamido. And for the iso osmolar contrast agent, uh, the contrast media was eodexno. And the primary endpoint is contrast induced acute kidney injury. So after propenic score matching from the left hand side, you can see there are around 2,200 patients in both groups. And in the right panel, you can see the uh, baseline characteristic that all the factors are actually comparable between these two groups after propenic score matching. From the results, the incidence of contrast-induced acute kidney injury between low osmolar contrast agent and iso osmolar contrast agents groups after propenic score matching, the difference is not statistically significant. And also the same scenario can be applied to the subgroup analysis stratified by other variables, including age, gender, comorbidity, and also the baseline factors. And there are several factors actually being identified in this cohort, including pre-existing chronic kidney disease, high volume of contrast, anemia, use of ROS blockers, and dehydrations. And these factors are also identified in several studies and also be mentioned in the ACR guidelines. So in summary for this topic, there is no difference between iso-osmolar contrast agent and low-osmolar contrast agent regarding the renal safety based on the published evidence and also based on the gui guideline recommendations, except for certain contrast media demonstrated by some studies, including eosaglate or eohexo. And we may need to pay more attention on the patient baseline factors, such as baseline chronic kidney disease, the volume of contrast, and the baseline medications, which are identified in several cohorts and also mentioned in many guidelines. With that, uh, this is my last slide. Thank you very much. And also thanks again for the invitation from HKRA. Thank you, Dr. Ma.
And uh, okay, let me introduce the uh, second speaker, Professor Zhang Yongping from Tani Field Imaging Medical Limited. Professor Zhang is currently the Chair Professor of Biomedical Engineering of Department of Biomedical Engineering in the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. And he is also the Director of the Research Institute for Smart Aging and Director of the Jockey, Jockey Cup Smart Aging Hub. He received the Bachelor of Science and Master in Engineering in electronics and information engineering from the University of Science and Technology of China. He received a PhD degree in the biomedical engineering from the Hong Kong Polytechnic University in 1997. After a postdoctoral fellowships at the University of Windsor, Canada, he joined the Pony U as an assistant professor and was promoted to the Professor in 2008 and Chair Professor in 2019, respectively. He was the Associate Director of the Research Institute of in Innovative Borders in Poly U from 2008 to 2010. He served as a founding head of the Department of Biomedical Engineering during 2012 to 2020. Professor Jen made research interest in cool biomedical ultrasound and smart aging technologies. He was rated as a top 2% citation scholar in the area of AI and image processes in the survey conducted by Stanford University in 2021 and 2022. He published over 290 journals, paper, and wrote two books. A number of technologies invaded by he, his team have been successfully com commercialized, including ScoreNeoScan, which won many international and local awards. Professor Jen is a senior member of Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, a fellow of Hong Kong Institute of Engineers, past secretary of the World Association of Chinese Biomedical Engineers, past chair of the Biomedical Engineer Division of Hong Kong IE, and honest advisor of Hong Kong Federation of Senior, Senior Citizens Industry and Hong Kong Medical and Healthcare Device Industry Association. He also served as a president of the Guangdong Hong Kong Macau chapter of the International Society of Technology. He has served as an associate editor and editorial board members for the same leading journals in, in the fields. Today, his presentation topic is Scoliosis Scan, 3D ultrasound imaging with AI and scoliosis assessment. Welcome and give a big hand to Professor Jan. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman. I I'm very really sorry to uh, give you a, such a long <laughs> introduction. Yeah. Thank you for reading it. Um, also, thanks uh, to Hong Kong uh, Radiographer Association. Uh, this is really my great honor to share with you some of our work. Uh, as uh, our chairman just in introduced, I'm from the PolyU Biomedical Engineering de Department. But actually, before 2012, uh, we are in the Department of uh, Informatics uh, and in <laughs> Department of Health Technology and the Informatics. So, so that, that department actually was established in 2006, when three groups of colleagues and students combined. One is a radiographer. Originally, many of you actually graduated at that time uh, in uh, optometry and radiography, okay? So in 2006, we combined together with the medical laboratory science. At that time, is in school of, uh, at that time, is department of nursing. And so we are from, name is Jockey Club Rehabilitation Engineering Center. So we, we merged into a department, and uh, that is in the Department of uh, uh, the Faculty of Health and Social Science. And in 2012, actually we separated from that department and moved to engineering faculty. So this is a little bit of history for some of you. So actually I made taught some class for some of you, okay, because I taught radiographer students, uh, master students. So today I would like to introduce you uh, in some way a sharing, okay, because uh, 
uh, we today we have uh, two big company, uh, one from China, another one from overseas, uh, United Imaging and uh, Canon. Uh, so for us, this is a quite small company, but it's a unique because it is invented in Hong Kong and grown in Hong Kong. So uh, this technique uh, using ultrasound, uh, for some reason I have been working in ultrasound for almost 30 years. Okay, so uh, recently I also participated in, I see that the timer does not start, so maybe I can have more time. Okay, let me, uh, so quite surprisingly, uh, even you may not see, even you are working in radiography department, but I have not seen so many ultrasound devices. This is uh, the toys that we have since 2001 when I first became the assistant professor in Poly U. And you can see we have 10 million uh, dollar, Hong Kong dollar devices on the up uh, right corner, and that is for animal. And we can have very small devices, uh, very cheap devices, and many devices actually here is different from what you are using because we can assess uh, the raw data, radio frequency data. This is because of that, we can do a lot of research. So this is slightly different for, from you. But anyhow, we are proud to have all this. And uh, my team have been mainly working on three areas. And we are going to have the third uh, book. Actually, now we are working with Springer, uh, supposed to be uh, completing next year or the year after. So the first and also my earliest one, starting my P from my PhD in poly is the elasticity imaging and the measurement. And later on, I'm work, mainly working on 3D ultrasound, and there's a leader to this device that I'm going to introduce. And we are very, very happy that the telefield medical imaging want to bring it to the market. So this is why many things uh, I can share, because uh, really from a research result coming to a commercial product is really not easy. So this is over the last uh, uh, 10 years I have learned. And in the middle, actually, we created this name called the sonomyograph. So some of you may know electromyograph, that is electrical signal generated by muscle during contraction. But the electromyograph has a limitation. That is, when you want to differentiate the signal from different muscles, it's very challenging because uh, all the electrical signal will be combined when we collect the, the uh, electrical signal from surface using electrode. The ultrasound, as all of us know, that we can see different muscle parts in our body, no matter is neighboring or is overlapped. So this actually makes us to think in 2006, and we create this name, and now this be more and more used and ultimately for. So the idea is that we use the muscle architectural change as an indicator for the muscle function, and that can be used for muscle control as well, like a prosthesis and we are working on other control as well, as well as the muscle uh, assessment. Regarding today's topic, scoliosis, I think uh, uh, many of you may know this well, but I just very briefly introduce a little bit. So our spine should be uh, lateral, node, lateral node deformation, okay? Uh, anterior posterior has a natural deformation. But unfortunately, around 5% of kids during their, mainly during their adolescent stage, they will develop this disease called a scoliosis. Uh, since the reason unknown and happens mainly in adolescent stage, so this is why they call it AIS, adolescent uh, idiopathic sclerosis. So, so, and uh, another unfortunate thing is that females' uh, incidence is much, much higher than male. So, around the, for severe cases is, is around the three to seven. As all of you know, and I believe many of you are taking a lot of X-ray for sclerosis patients in your practice. So this is a golden standard, but we all know that radio, uh, uh, the X-ray radiographer uh, has two features. One is 2D, and second is has radiation. Even though we recently have the low radiation uh, device called the EOS, EOS system, okay? But still have radi radiation. But anyway, this is a golden standard. But uh, how about the other devices? Uh, many of you are operating MI and CT. Now uh, that can be used before surgery, but normally will not be routinely using for uh, scoliosis assessment. The reason is the posture and certainly cost and time and other things, but mainly the cost, the posture. But uh, we do have some other methods 
a simpler method, that is a surface topography. There are many different ways. But unfortunately, surface topography can only provide surface information, not internal information. And this is the beauty of all our imaging devices or medical imaging devices. So this is why at most it can be used for screening. But unfortunately, the treatment of sclerosis is mainly based on angle. The reason is obvious because we do not know the reason, do not know the reason of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the occurrence as well as the progression. So this is the only way is based on the degree, then determine what uh, treatment technique being used. Uh, starting from brace, and actually before brace, we can do the exercises. Uh, in, in Chinese, we have, can do massage, Chinese medicine. And ultimately, we need to do surgery. But certainly that should be avoided because once do the surgery, the spine will be fused. And there's uh, uh, a lot of uh, effects. So X-ray uh, has been continuously using from the very beginning. And uh, remember in the adolescent stage, uh, kids are growing very fast. And this is also the why the reason uh, we have the, this sclerosis. Uh, so in one word, there's a lot of x-ray need to be taken. But you may ask, uh, just like earlier speaker just mentioned about the, uh, the contrast aging effect. So similar x-ray has any effect or not, we know it has may effect because, but before 2016, there's no solid evidence. What is the effect? But in 2016, a Denmark group actually they followed for 25 years for a group of subjects in comparison control, and they found uh, 40 uh, 4.8 times higher cancer uh, uh, incidence, and mainly breast cancer and overall cancer. So that because of female issues. So so this actually alerted the whole society and. Uh, I think particularly in Western countries that the awareness is very high, as low as possible for X-ray dose, because they know the effects there. How about ultrasound? Uh, again, uh, we all know that it is uh, uh, ionizing, there's non-ionizing uh, imaging tools and uh, used so commonly in the, in the medical field. And uh, how about 3D ultrasound? Actually 3D ultrasound mainly, as far as I know, uh, three area uh, fetus is one area, and one, another one is heart, uh, but need a very special device. And the uh, third one, uh, nowadays we have device, is the breast cancer uh, screening. Then uh, for our team, actually we starting from a very early stage, 2002, actually we start to working on the 3D ultrasound imaging. So mainly focusing on the musculoskeletal or in, in the very beginning the muscle. And for some reasons, uh, that is really uh, in some way very good today because I come from biomedical engineering, actually my first degree in electronics. So that is interdisciplinary. The reason is because in our biomedical engineering department, we have colleagues working with sclerosis, mainly for brace. Uh, the reason is because we are training 70% uh, of pro prosthetics and orthotics in our program uh, in Port U. So because of this, uh, we are, have colleagues working uh, brace. And on the other hand, my ultrasound, starting from a very early stage, has been collaborating uh, with orthopedics. Uh, we start from uh, articular cartilage and bone, a lot of other uh, tissues. So this is why I know there's a disease called the sclerosis. But before that, I don't know. So, so this is the reason. Now we have technique, and we know the problem. And starting from 2000, uh, I think 2006, uh, we got the first uh, grant to working on this. So let me introduce a little bit details in uh, this area. Try to control my time. And uh, this is a B mode uh, image of spine, uh, the cross sectional view. And typically, we can see there are spinous process on the top and the two sides, some lateral features. Uh, if in the thoracic region, it is a, a transverse process. And uh, now, the main feature in this image actually from our radiographer's point of view is nothing because it's a black region after the bone. So, so that is also true. So how, how we ultimately actually divide this device? Uh, let me show you the video showing how the spine being scanned from the bottom to, to the neck. So this is a whole scanning process. And you can see again, a lot of the dark regions. Okay? And the most information may be coming from the bone and some muscle information, but we are interested in bone. So let, let's have a look. 
So the, the key is that we, in some way, creatively or crazily, actually think that we can image the bone using ultrasound, but it actually cannot. Because when the ultrasound hits the bone, uh, all the signal will reflect and leaving up all the shadows. And this is artifacts, as you have learned okay, in school. So, so we developed this device. So the idea is that we stack all these images together uh, in 3D. As because of this, we made a special probe. Uh, that probe can track, being tracked. So the location and orientation of the probe uh, can be known. So because of that, we can stack all the image in its uh, real position and orientation. And finally, we do a lot of image processing. In the very beginning, traditional processing, but nowadays we have more and more AI. I believe this is why we are invited because today we are talking about smart radiographer, <laughs> radiography. So uh, you, you later will see that we do a lot of uh, uh, deep learning uh, for, for this uh, project. So ultimately we form an image like this. So very surprisingly, when we apply the patents, uh, some patents being processed almost for 10 years before they give us, because everybody think this, this idea is too simple, okay? But, but the crazy thing is that we basically use some wasted information or, or distortion information and to form image. So on the right side, that is the main image. Later, I will show you a lot. So in this image, what do we see? The dark region, that is the shadow of bone. But for some reason, we form the image like an X-ray image, and then we can use that for uh, 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 angle measurement, the copper angle measurement. Okay, let me show you a little more detail. So this is how the image will be formed. And we are forming a coronal view image. But traditionally, ultrasound can only provide a cross-sectional view, transverse cross-sectional view. So as we are going up, each image will get a very small portion of, uh, of image, then put them together and to form this image. So you can see that uh, we are gradually forming the whole spine. So for kids around the 20 to 30 seconds of scanning time. So this is how it's being formed. Now we can see that with this technique, we are able to form uh, images for uh, sclerosis kits with different severities as we've seen here. And the main feature is the, the middle one is formed by the sp uh, 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 span, uh, the, the uh, okay, the, the bone in the middle, uh, I, I suddenly forgot the name, sorry. I'm a little bit nervous in front of all, all the experts. Yeah, spinous process, okay, spinous process. Uh, and the side one, and mainly formed by rib, and also transverse process and other features. So uh, you may ask, how about the accuracy? Okay, since we are providing a tool for clinical use. So we have done a lot of research, and this is our latest one after a lot of um, enhancement. So you can see almost one-to-one. -one. And remember, even X-ray, two radiographer to measure, they will have deviation. So the stand deviation is around this plus and minus five degrees. So therefore that is in some way very nice. So now we have developed a lot of things and this is one of, uh, the, of them, that is automatic measurement. So now we can do conduct automatic measurement completely and by deep learning. So in this model, we train around 2000 images and another thing, or the beauty of ultrasound is that we can make it small. Because nowadays, I think all of you know that we have a pound size ultrasound uh, scanner uh, linking with a, a terminal like a PC or, or, or tablet or even mobile phone. So we now make uh, this device uh, very small and the uh, image can also be formed. Uh, because of penetration issue, actually uh, the image are a little bit blurred and also because of the tracking sensor. In this uh, portable uh, device, the tracking sensor we use in the optical tracking. In the bigger device, we use the electromagnetic tracking device. So remember, we are 3D. So this was not only radiation free in comparison to X-ray, but X-ray can only provide 2D information. But ultrasound, after the scanning, we have the 3D data. So because of that, we can do a lot of 3D uh, information related uh, visualization and, uh, and measurement as well. Oh, sorry. So one, uh, one, one, one thing we are working on is uh, 
uh, we are modeling, taking modeling, okay, for the 3D uh, model. But remember, there's one part ultrasound cannot see, that is the dark region, the vertebral body. Because the ultrasound from the back, we cannot see the uh, vertebral body. But unfortunately, for most of the sclerosis subjects, they at least can have one X-ray. Once they confirm their sclerosis, they will have one X-ray. So that X-ray can be used to fuse into our uh, 3D modeling. And this is some other model you can see here. We, we, are, we are working on this area, or using AI. Without AI, we cannot do this, basically. <laughs> so, so if you have not been yeah, thinking about AI, I think you need to think about that very soon. AI will go to your practice. Okay? So uh, to scan, uh, we also use a robotic. So that is very straightforward, robotic arm, because uh, I know many of the sonographers have fatigue. Okay, So this is why we are thinking about that. If we keep scanning uh, the whole day, that will be a huge problem. So this is why it's very natural. But the one big thing that we are doing is prediction for progression. Because this doctor told us that it's the holy grail in the field. Thinking about that, uh, when we first diagnose a subject with 10 degrees, that is classified as sclerosis. And we can tell the parent uh, and the kids after five years, if you do, do not do anything, it will be how many degrees? Okay, so, so this is why uh, we are working on this. And the, the reason why we think it can be successful is because using uh, X ray, they use the two plane X ray and model the 3D uh, model. And then from the 3D information, 90% uh, of accuracy for prediction. And so that's why we think we are providing 3D information and we can do this. Now, so far we have collected over 1,000 uh, cases in, in P2H and uh, many of them already been followed by four years and some already five years. So this is uh, uh, very soon we, we should have the result. Uh, again, AI, and this is somewhat crazy. When my student first proposes, I do not believe. Okay, show me the evidence. But now I start to believe because we can actually convert the ultrasound chrono image into X-ray image by training. So, so, so this is something happening. Remember this model only been trained with 150 data. And now we are working with PWH with 2000 uh, images. So I think the result will be much better. So in summary, so we are, we are providing a device, and if you want to know more, actually uh, the, the company has a booth there, you can have a look. So uh, this, this, this is not the, like uh, unreal, but actually real. Ultrasound really can provide all this. X-ray definitely is accurate, but it has many limitations. And other methods, they have uh, their advantages, but they also have shortcomings, particularly cannot going through the body, this is why they cannot see. Uh, what's inside. And then you may ask, okay, so, so what? You have this device, how it can be used? So according to our 10 years of exploration, and now the device has been installed in Europe, in Australia, in China, uh, rapidly increased, and recently we got a registry in uh, Thailand, and now working in Malaysia and Indonesia. Very soon, I think, in uh, the uh, East uh, Asia, were installed. So, the idea is that because of its unique features, basically two unique features, one is radiation free and second can provide 3D information. So basically we can cover the whole management cycle, starting from screening uh, to follow up monitoring, as well as a treat outcome. And we can provide much frequent imaging instead of X-ray maybe every year or at most every half year. And another thing, uh, now our device in Germany, they are practicing uh, one thing is during the subject being treated with the manipulation. So they use ultrasound to scan. So they to confirm the spine inside is really as what the uh, trainer want to be. So, so that will be really, really helpful. And certainly uh, the prediction, as I mentioned, we hope that we can provide very soon. These are all the installation in different places. And uh, we are very fortunate. This Hong Kong company uh, has been, I got the, uh, the first round of uh, investment and also device. Uh, we got the first uh, Bank, of uh, Bank of China Innovation and Technology uh, uh, Prize 
uh, the on, only one actually in that category called health and life. So there's a lot of awards we have won. Now I want to verify the device is really developed by us, not some copy. Okay, so so we we have quite a number of patents actually. Uh, you can see starting from 2007 when we have the first prototype and gradually build. I really want to thank uh, one of our uh, the, the the founder. Uh, he is an industrialist. Okay, and before the first round of investment, he and his company had put over 60 million Hong Kong dollar to bring uh, research output really become a product. So this is the role. Actually, you can see if we come from our early uh, early research in uh, 3D ultrasound is almost 20 years. And that is also why Hong Kong is so difficult to develop innovation and technology industry, because we need a patient. But uh, in many cases, because of the historical reason, Hong Kong business businessman does not have patience. They want to have a quick money. So in case uh, you or your friends have money and persuade them to be have patience. <laughs> okay, so these are patents that we want to file. And in some way, this is very strange because most of our research will simultaneously file patents and publish papers. But for this one, uh, because the company is interested, so this is why we file patent more. And to protect them, you may say, is totally for commercial reason. Actually, actually not. Uh, we, we even file not only in China, but in, uh, in may, major, major markets. The reason I, I want to share with you, because I learned something from the elasticity imaging. Uh, some of you may know elastography. That field is fantastic in the very beginning, because I'm, I was in the beginning when my, my PhD starts. But later I found that there's a problem, because there are too many techniques. And also too many companies can make this technique and everyone say they are the best and make the conditions actually very uncomfortable. This was up to now, only in some specific regions like a, a fibrous scan, the liver fibrosis measurement, uh, majority of the area is not well utilized. Okay. So the one reason is standard. So this is why from the beginning, I'm thinking that I should do file the patents and fortunately the industry, uh, the companies they support us to file patents. And ultimately we have all this very intensive uh, uh, protections. So that, that is the main thing. So how about the future as a company, they need to survive. So in addition to sclerosis now, they are thinking the whole body musculoskeletal uh, tissues. So they are now new, new, uh, develop a new device and also for the surgery and uh, this year we got a uh, government funding and to use 3D, to use 3D ultrasound to guide some surgical procedure of uh, the uh, bone fracture uh, in kids. So that mainly in the elbow. Okay, so they will insert some pin and we want to guide the pin. So this is why that is for the surgical side. Now, I, I think I, I may still have some few minutes. Okay, so I, I will stop here. I hope the chairman can allow me to take some questions because I still have time. <laughs> if they do not have a question, I have 20 slides more. I can speak, continue to speak. Later. Okay, let me continue. I want to use some of my time, okay. <laughs> so you may say that, okay, what research you can do, have done to verify that. Actually, we have done a lot of research first to verify that. Uh, that is for reliability and the validity tests. So you can see we do a lot of intra, inter, operator, rater, uh, all the measurements. So uh, the overall, overall idea is that it is very repeatable. So this is why you scan one, scan second, uh, then they are very repeatable. I do not go to details. Uh, this is another validation study in Netherlands. Uh, they are the first uh, uh, installment uh, of us. And later on, we actually have a lot of progression study, as I mentioned, okay? So X-ray, uh, if above, during the, uh, 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 between the two tests, X-ray tests, if the angle change larger than five degrees, that is defined as progression. So if, if our ultrasound can detect similar thing, then we can do the progression monitoring. But as I mentioned, we want to do more for prediction using 3D information. And another thing is that we found that, oh, there's a coupling between the sagittal and the chronal view uh, information. Remember, we are 3D. This is why 
by single scan, we not only got the chronic information, but also uh, the sagittal information. So the finding is that for similar mild angle, if the kids have flat thoracic region, then these kids will progress. If the anterior posterior curve is normal, then less chance to postgraduate. And we can measure rotation as well. The, because spine uh, in the sclerosis, particularly severe sclerosis, the rotation is very large, actually. And we can do the scanning in all the postures, any postures. So this is uh, one of my uh, colleagues actually working with brace. Uh, they, before the brace design, they need to know the kids, uh, the flexibility. So this is actually flexibility test under different postures. And this is the reason why CT and MI is not commonly used for uh, diagnosis for sclerosis. You can see that when the posture changes, uh, the spine not only change in the uh, sagittal view, but also the coronal view change a lot. Okay, because of that, the reason is the gravity, because we standing there uh, very different. And this is four bending, uh, similar. Four bending actually is the screening method. But we do not know what happens when the kids fall bend. So, so we, we try to understand more about this. And how about the, uh, in x-ray, I believe some of you know this, we will we will use different postures during x-ray, particularly for EOS, because they will, do not want to block uh, the sagittal view. So, well, this actually affects the deformity? Actually, yes, but mainly affecting the uh, sagittal view, not coronal view. So this uh, coronal view is quite consistent. This is my last slide. Thank you so much. The first speaker is uh, Dr. Yan Tong. Dr. Tong is the clinical marketing and application specialist in Shanghai United Imaging Healthcare Company Limited. Dr. Tong study in US Texas A&M University for the BSc in Biomedical Engineering and then study in uh, Oxford, England to complete his PhD in Magnetic Resonance Physics University. Dr. Tong conducts research covering functional MRI, diffusion MRI, statistical parametric mapping, and mammalian, mammalian green fluorescent protein reconstruction. He now focuses in developed advanced MR sequences and image processing methods for the key construct, uh, cons customers of the Shanghai United Imaging Healthcare Company and Limited. Apart from the business, Dr. Tong has great talent in languages. He can speak English, Chinese, Spanish, French, German, and Turkish. Today, he will speak to us in English. And uh, today, his topic to share with us is uh, uh, archiving the impossible for imaging total body ML imaging at 5T. Please give a big hand for Dr. Tong. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here attending this event at this great venue. Uh, so I'll have a introduction on our five Tesla MR scanner. So I'll have 20 minutes uh, to convince you uh, that uh, five Tesla is a great field strength and this is where the future is. So if we look at the status quo of MRI, uh, many of you would operate 1.5 Tesla and three Tesla scanners. Uh, they are the clinical routine and they are our workhorse uh, for our examinations every day. Uh, Apart from that, there have been a series of uh, endeavors across the world uh, to achieve or look at MRI at a different field strength. These include 4 Tesla, 4.7 Tesla, 7 Tesla, 9 te 4 Tesla, and so on. Uh, however, uh, for whole body imaging, none of this field strength is clinically approved. So uh, if we have to think about the future of MRI and uh, uh, in reality, the field strength of clinical MRI has not changed for several decades. Uh, what is the next field strength? Uh, what are we looking at? So to, to answer that question, we'll have to first look at the challenges of uh, imaging at a higher, higher field strength. So if we want to image at a higher field strength, what are uh, the major problems? So number one, we have uh, image uniformity. 
So as the field strength increases, the RF wavelength increases in our tissue as well, uh, thus resulting in shading artifacts, which is quite uh, um, uh, challenging at 3T even uh, for abdominal imaging. Uh, however, according to our simulation, um, 5T has a great potential of providing higher SNR compared to uh, the 3T uh, images while preserving the B1 homogeneity. Uh, and uh, uh, according to our simulation, uh, this is uh, particularly uh, beneficial if you compare that against uh, 70. I'll explain why we're able to achieve that in just a minute. Uh, number two, we have the issue of uh, safety. So in terms of uh, safety for MRI, if you look at the RF, uh, we're primarily interested in the SAR or the specific absorption rate. So SAR um, is proportional to the square of the field strength. Therefore, going from three to five to seven uh, is a particularly uh, it's particularly troublesome. Um, according to our simulation, again, uh, the local SAR at 5T can be reduced to uh, by up to 80% compared to that in the 7 Tesla. Uh, so again, we think that um, uh, 5 Tesla might be a sweet spot uh, if you look at the comparisons against the 3T and 7T. Uh, so uh, in the end, why did we pick the 5 Tesla? Um, there is a bit of a history in here as well, because if you look at the first prototypes of MRI, uh, we have a two Tesla scanner as a prototype in the uh, uh, 1980s. So what we end up today is the 1.5 Tesla for our routine clinical work. We also had earlier uh, prototypes of four Tesla MRIs. Maybe there are um, you know, a couple, three or four uh, in the world. Uh, however, we settled with the three Tesla MRI for higher field, and that's a clinical workhorse. Uh, at the moment, we do have 70 com uh, commercial offerings from several vendors. However, their clinical use is limited to the head and MSK applications. So we think that uh, uh, 5T could be the breakthrough of whole body ultra high field MR applications. Uh, with that, uh, let me introduce uh, the uh, 5 Tesla scanner from Yantin Imaging. Uh, we have, of course, a 5T magnet with uh, zero helium boil off. We also have a very powerful gradient system of 120 millitesla per meter of, uh, of the uh, gradient strength and 200 tesla per meter per second of slew rate, uh, which allows us to explore uh, neuroscience with artificial tensor imaging and functional MRI. Along with that, we also have eight channel body transmit system. So that allows us for body imaging, uh, for the abdomen, uh, for imaging the abdomen, the pelvis, and so on, and the spine, uh, which is not uh, possible at the moment for seven Tesla. Um, we all know that uh, space is precious in Hong Kong. Um, and for the five Tesla scanner, uh, it has very low sighting requirement. So generally, it can fit, in, uh, fit a 5T in a 3T room. Uh, we do have whole body clinical applications. And uh, finally, we have the capability of doing multinuclear MRI and MRS. So why can we generate homogeneous images on the five Tesla, uh, even though we know that abdominal imaging can be uh, homogeneous even at 3T? Uh, this is because we have a unique uh, eight-channel volume transmit coil enabled by our eight independent uh, RF power amplifiers. So these amplifiers allow us to play uh, independently driven RF waveforms in each of these channels, and we can use this uh, hardware configuration to achieve homogeneous excitation of our body. So uh, if we look at the 3T and 5T image comparisons to the right, we can see that uh, um, homogeneity is really not an issue uh, for abdominal imaging at 5T. Coming back to the sighting uh, requirements, uh, we can see that uh, earlier generations of uh, seven Tesla uh, are very, very heavy. Uh, and um, in terms of the weight and the, the five Gauss line, actually the 5T is very similar and comparable to the 3T. So again, uh, generally a 5T can be, uh, uh, can be installed in a 3T room. So if you have a 3T scanner and you wanted five, that's probably not an issue. Uh, so uh, if you look at the clinical images, uh, we do have a whole body application, uh, so starting from neural, spine, abdominal, MSK, cardiac, uh, and angiography uh, and whole body uh, capabilities. Uh, I'll spend uh, a few minutes uh, in just um, the coming slides uh, to explain to you uh, what it can do for you in uh, each of the major anatomies. So uh, 
let's start from the head. And uh, this is uh, a very, very interesting field in which uh, 5G can bring you a lot of benefits. So the first thing we look at is TOF MRA. So here we have a comparison of the same subject scanned on the 5 Tesla and the 3 Tesla with the same acquisition time and imaging resolution. Uh, very obviously, you can see that uh, not only can we visualize more distal vessels, uh, we can see them more clearly as well. So this is because uh, we have a more of a, a flowing effect uh, with uh, TOF and we have a longer T1 at 5 Tesla as well. Um, so uh, we can see more than um, uh, some distal vessels in the uh, top MRI. Here's another example uh, with 5G and 3G comparisons on the same subject. Uh, we can see more abundant uh, uh, LSA or lateroclostriate arteries uh, on the 5G. Uh, and in the 3G, we can barely make out of them. Maybe you can see one of them, but uh, uh, in the 5G, you can see them much better with uh, higher accuracy. Uh, so here is another example which uh, shows what we can see with a 5 Tesla TOF image, uh, which you cannot at 3T. So at 5T, using this example, uh, we're leveraging the uh, gain in intrinsic SNR at this higher field strength to visualize the shape of the arterial dissection, uh, which is confirmed by our DSA examination as well to the middle. Uh, which, uh, but this cannot be seen at the 3T images. Uh, we can also have high resolution T1 weighted uh, 3D images uh, to look at the arterial dissection and the fossil lumen, uh, again, confirmed by the DSA. This is another example uh, in which high resolution 5D images allows us to visualize the opening of the LSA and uh, um, you, you know, can see as indicated by the arrows, the plaque at the MCA and infarction in the distal branches. In addition, to, in addition to routine um, anatomical images, such as T1, T2 weighted uh, images, uh, one thing that is particularly beneficial at a higher field strength is SWI, or sensitivity weighted image. Uh, this is because not only do we have the gain in the intrinsic SNR brought about by the um, increased field strength, the sensitivity effect is also more pronounced at 5 Tesla. And that allows us to uh, not only see the images with better resolution, but we can have a better contrast as well. So here we have, uh, again, 5 and 3T comparisons on the same subject um, with this uh, even shorter uh, spatial resolution, uh, shorter scan time and the same spatial, uh, spatial resolution, we can visualize the cortical venue expansion uh, much better. We can utilize the increased SNR to gain higher quality images for diffusion as well. So here we have an example of extremely high resolution, which is 0.8 isotropic, uh, enabled by our multiband or simultaneous multi-slice uh, um, factors, a factor of two. Uh, with this, uh, if we reconstruct the white matter tracks or what we generally call uh, tractography, we can uh, come up with these uh, U-shaped uh, cortical fibers, which are generally uh, difficult to find uh, at a lower field strength or a lower resolution. The same can be said for functional fMRI. Um, this is using a uh, simple finger tapping task uh, on both sides um, with a block of 80 seconds. So with um, 5 Tesla, we can use its uh, resolution, uh, use its SNR to gain high resolution. This is 0.8 isotropic. Uh, so we can see that um, the distribution uh, of the activated areas or the activation regions in a deep cortex uh, can be much better uh, visualized compared to the um, uh, low resolution image with uh, 3.5 millimeter isotropic. Next, we can move on to the body, uh, which uh, again, at the moment, cannot be clinically imaged uh, for uh, fields higher than five, um, namely seven. Um, first, we can have a case of a uh, kidney patient. So if you look at the image on the left, we have a, uh, a you know, a bright spot possibility, but we cannot be sure. So this is with routine um, resolution, slight thickness and uh, acquisition duration. We can, however, try to increase the matrix and thus have, that's having a higher resolution at three Tesla, which is the one in the middle. 
However, at this uh, case, we are uh, actually SNR starved. So you can see that even though we have higher spatial resolution in the middle, we cannot be 100% sure whether we have a lesion or not on the kidney. Uh, if we perform the same examination, again, on the same subject at 5 tesla, uh, we can be very positive of the lesion because of the SNR gain, and the boundaries are more clearly visualized as well. So that's this is something that can be really helpful to these micro lesions across the body uh, if we scan on the 5 tesla. Here is another MRA example, uh, which is renal MRA. Here we are using um, inversion recovery based uh, balanced SSP acquisition uh, to look at the, the renal artery branches uh, on 3 tesla and 5 tesla. Uh, as you can see with uh, better spatial resolution, we can see more distal vessels and better. In addition to SWI and fMRI, another imaging method that is particularly useful at higher field strength is MRS or magnetic resonance spectroscopy. This is because not only do we have more signal, uh, which allows us, which gives us a higher peak compared to the baseline, we also have more spectral separation. And that means that uh, at higher field strength, the peaks by the laws of physics are going to be farther apart uh, in the acquisition. So here uh, we have a prostate case. Uh, we all know that uh, in prostate cancer, uh, the, the metabolite citrate is very important. So with this case, we can see that on the 5G spectra, uh, we have the split of the peak uh, of the citrate peak. And this peak is actually a doublet. Uh, however, if you have, um, you know, 3T or lower um, field strength scanners, this may not be able to, uh, you may not be able to uh, see that difference just because of the uh, limited spectral separation at lower field. We can uh, apply similar experiences we had in the brain to the abdomen. Here we're also trying uh, susceptibility with imaging uh, in the liver. So we have a, a technique we call U-switch, which is essentially SWI in the um, in the abdomen. Uh, so here uh, we have a 53-year-old patient with uh, um, some post-interventional changes in the right lobe uh, and uh, also can uh, visualize the portal vein tumor thrombosis as well. Um, the other thing we can do very well is uh, MRCP. Uh, again, none of that is available currently on our um, 70 offerings in the market, uh, but uh, this can uh, this kind of uh, examinations can be routinely uh, performed on our 5 tesla scanners with very high fidelity and uh, uh, resolution. Um, finally, for the body, we have some um, prostate cases uh, for um, imaging the pelvis. This can be particularly challenging um, at a higher field strength because of the limited penetration of the RF signal. However, uh, with our eight channel transmit system, we're able to achieve a uh, very homogeneous excitation, excitation and uh, good uniformity in the uh, T2 and uh, uh, T1 uh, structural images uh, very, very well. Uh, we can also do the same for um, EPI-based diffusion, uh, and we can see some uh, neoplastic lesions, uh, which is also, again, sort of com confirmed by the uh, PSA value of this patient, which is 5.43. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, imaging the lumbar spine. Uh, we also have some good cases of uh, the patient being scanned on the 3T and 5T respectively with the same uh, resolution. Uh, we can see that um, some of the details, particularly in the uh, cauda equina, can be visualized very well and we can have a, a better signal at 5T. Uh, next, we can move on to cardiac. So cardiac imaging is something that uh, uh, I think you are very uh, familiar with as uh, radiographers. Um, many doctors and uh, even radiographers prefer to scan cardiac uh, on the 1.5T system. Uh, this is because of the, uh, the, ch the challenges associated with the field strength at 3T. Um, but uh, with our uh, 5T scanner, um, you can actually get uh, very reasonable and great cardiac images uh, thanks to the increased SNR and our uh, eight channel transmit system. So here is a comparison of uh, uh, CINE images. Uh, and using this uh, higher field strength, we can uh, aim for a, a reduced uh, um, re higher resolution and also reduced size thickness. So com uh, compared to a conventional 1.8 by 1.8 by 6, we're looking at 1 by 1 by 3. So here we can uh, better 
visualize the muscle trabeculae and tendon cords in the heart, as indicated by the black and white arrows. Um, the same can be said for uh, dark blood uh, T2 images and also um, post gadolinium uh, PSIR images, uh, which show the uh, sub endocardium fibrotic structures on this particular patient. And uh, finally, for these uh, different anatomies, we're looking at uh, our extremities. Uh, first, we have uh, some MSK examples uh, here, a very simple um, case uh, for protein density weighted imaging. Uh, we can see that um, the SNR is greater with the same spatial resolution and even reduced uh, scan time. Uh, and this is another case in which we utilize the increased SNR to uh, give us higher resolution, higher spatial resolution, which clearly, clearly displays the bone texture and the microscopic lesions uh, for the image to the right uh, on the phytosome. And uh, finally, we have uh, a base contrast based MRA uh, in the extremities, in this case, in the foot. So we have um, uh, one on the left in the, on the 3T and one on the right um, acquired on the 5T. So this is a very stark contrast. And uh, in general, uh, from our experience so far, uh, MRA is, is really great um, at this new field strength. Um, and um, so this is our 5T scanner, and we're looking at a, an ultra high field future with advanced whole body coverage, advanced applications. Uh, here are some, some um, few more topics uh, that we do not have the time to um, talk to you about, including T1 row, arterial spin labeling, uh, QSM, and um, uh, APT-based uh, or CES uh, methods, and also uh, fat quantification and conscious cancer MRA and so on. Uh, so the, the future is, uh, is boundless. Um, currently, we do have um, six installations, uh, and we have two more uh, going on as we speak. We expect to have more by the end of the year. Uh, so with our installation sites so far, we've had uh, quite a few papers published already. Uh, again, we expect more to come in the uh, coming months and years. Uh, one of them, uh, which is particularly interesting, is the one uh, maybe the second to the left, uh, which is published on radiology uh, earlier uh, this year. Uh, and uh, this is a very interesting customer who has access to the 3T, 5T, and 7T scanners. So they had a comparison of um, TOF MRA on these uh, field strings. So I, I think it's very interesting. And if you're, um, you, if you had any uh, interest, please have a, have a read the paper. Um, so uh, that's all of my presentation. And let, let us introduce the fourth speaker. Uh, Mr. He. Mr. He is studying in the Hong Kong University, uh, Hong Kong Polytechnic University as a PhD candidate in HTI department. He received his BSc in Central South University, which is a Changsha GBA and MSc in City University, Hong Kong. He worked for ASHRI before as a as an engineer for medical image analysis, optical coherence tomography, segmentation, and lesion detection. His publication covers COVID-19 chest infection images, artificial intelligence in digital pathology applications. His main interest now goes to object detection and segmentation in medical images. Today, he will share with us on the topic, deep learning based def uh, differentiation of COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 infection cases and cementation of COVID-19 infected regions in chest X-ray images. Let's welcome Mr. He. Uh, hello everyone, um, I'm uh, He Ze Bang from the Department of Health Technology and Informatics, the Polytechnic University, and I'm the PhD candidate. And today I will have my presentations about the deep learning based differentiation of COVID 19 and non COVID 19 infection cases and segmentation of COVID 19 infection regions in the chest X ray images. And while my major subject is the development of the artificial intelligence techniques, and it's a pleasure for me to uh, receive the experience from the medical experts. Uh, thank you. Okay. Um, 
First of all, um, I will introduce the contents of my presentations, including the background knowledge, the aims and object objectives of our research, the methodology in our studies, the experience in the differentiations and segmentations, and the experience results. The final part is the discussion significance and the future work of our work. First of all, uh, let me introduce some simple uh, background knowledge about the deep learning and the COVID-19 uh, infections. And as we know that the COVID-19, which is called the contagious disease caused by the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, it, which is the uh, most most threatened in the in the recent years, um, although the COVID-19 has already gone, the experience of of us to use the automatic technology to fight against with it is the uh, valuable experience when we face the pandemic again. Um, in the in the COVID nineteen uh, in the in the fighting against the COVID nineteen, we found that the highest efficient methods to diagnose and monitor the disease progress of patients is needed, while the uh, with the shortage of the radiologists and doctors. And then, and we find that the chest X-ray is a good way to monitor the disease progress for treatment and evaluate the therapy efficiency. Therefore, um, our target for applying the automatic technologies uh, in the chest X-ray is to accurately segment the COVID-19 infection regions from the chest X-ray images. And next, uh, let me introduce some uh, radiographic findings of COVID-19 in chest X-rays, which we will use for the uh, artificial intelligence. It includes the reticular patterns, ground gas opacities, consolidations, and part of the um, and part of and the combination of these uh, phenomena. Um, okay, and next is that uh, why we choose the chest X-ray as the as the image modality used in the uh, in the AI technologies is that the radiographic findings are very easily to find in the chest X-ray images, and it's also easy for the deep learning networks to find the find the infected regions and show to the doctors or show to the radiologists. And moreover, it's uh, very easy for the radiologists to annotate these infection regions for the network to learn. And um, that these two reasons um, leads to the uh, popular methodology in the chest X-ray as the uh, uh, AI technologies. Therefore, uh, various deep learning algorithms which want to segment the infection regions from the chest X-ray slides are pro proposed, and um, with the less less cost of the manpower and automatic workflow, and this this works make a uh, rapid progress in the in the COVID nineteen disease uh, diagnostics uh, diagnostics assistance and other applications. However, this application has a, a very serious problem that um, all the uh, majority of these words are assumed that the input uh, X-ray slides with the COVID-19 infections. However, in the real medical scene, is uh, impossible. While uh, some cases may have the infection, while some cases may have uh, non-infections or the non-COVID-19 infections. Therefore, um, where we, uh, uh, there is a very big problems of the data mixed with the COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 that. If the COVID nineteen infection and non COVID nineteen infection images are mixed in the input of the deep learning models uh, with the similar radiographic findings, the deep learning models will be very difficult to divide and further in further influence the performance of the uh, assist diagnostics. Therefore, um, before we segment the infection regions of the COVID nineteen, uh, we need to make a preset of the differentiation between the COVID nineteen and non COVID nineteen infection or even the normal slice before the segmentations. And then um, we will have two pipelines uh, in the recent work, uh, which wants to do this uh, differentiations and segmentations. First of all, um, they, will start, they will start by the classification models, which wants to uh, find out the COVID-19 slice first, and then apply the segmentation on this uh, COVID-19 slice. And secondly, and they want they will they will apply the segmentation first to find out the infection line regions, and then apply the classification models to uh, to identify if these infection like uh, regions are the real COVID nineteen regions. 
However, for these two pipelines, they will also have some problems. First of all, for the type one, which apply the classification models first, and um, while the segmentation is highly depending on the classification, while the classification uh, is also based on the whole images before, because it is the step before the segmentations, and the classification is applied not in the effective areas. Therefore, um, the performance of the classification is uh, has a, has its limit, limitations, and uh, while it will further influence the performance of the segmentations. And for the pipeline two, uh, which apply the segmentation first, while the segmentation could only find out the high probability regions, which we call the infection line regions, they will also have the problems that the COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 infections like the what. Uh, viral or bacteria phenomena may also have the similar radiography findings. Therefore, the actual classification could not perform the effect as the precept to differentiate the inputs and make the classification step uh, has less meaning. Therefore, um, we call the two problems of uh, current pipelines that the, uh, the classification is not, uh, not applied in the effective area and the classification could not perform as the Precept to differentiate the input first. And um, if um, we have proposed some solutions that um, for the effective area, we will use another type uh, instead of the inf infection like regions. In our work, we choose the lung regions, which is uh, also uh, easily annotated regions. And for the second problem, uh, uh, we, we need to use the result of the classification as a filter of segmentation before. Uh, we will have two. We will have the two solutions. That first, we integrate the classification into the segmentation pipeline, and then use the classification result as the gate functions to filter the segmentation. And then we will briefly introduce the aims and objectives of our uh, research subjects. And um, our aim is to develop a new le deep learning algorithm for automatic chest X-ray differentiation and infection segmentation of COVID-19 regions by utilizing the lung region information in both tasks. And then our objective includes to design the deep learning pipeline for differentiations to uh, extend the performance of our new pipeline and to solve the problem in medical practice for segmenting COVID-19 inf infections while the COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 infection are both exist in the data. And then and we will introduce some details of our uh, methodology. Um, first of all, uh, we use the public available data set, which also which called the COVID QES data set to apply applying our experience and never designed. It includes 5,826 chest rays and they also provide the lung region mass for us to develop our pipelines. And there's also some uh, samples from this data set, which is shown in the uh, slides. And then and we will briefly introduce the uh, networks we use in our, uh, the framework used in our uh, network designs. And the, the input chest edge images will be fed into the uh, feature extractor to it shared the general features of the chest X-ray images, and then the general features will fit into three, three, uh, three lines uh, parallelly. The first line is the this line, the differentiation line. It will output the result of the identification that if the images are COVID-19 infections, this 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 result will be treated as the gate functions to let the infection the infection regions uh, output normally. And for it, and if the uh, differentiation result is a non-COVID-19 and normal, and the gate function will control them to output a blank infection mass to avoid the false segmentations. And then um, the lung region information, uh, which is in the middle line, will control will be controlled the result of these two lines, which is uh, lung segment lung lung infusion segmentations and in the first line and the differentiation in the third line um, as the attention mechanisms. And then and this, these two lines will receive the uh, information of the lung regions and output their corresponding infection regions mass and the differentiation results. Moreover, um, we also apply the novel design uh, collaborative attention mechanism which used in our models. 
and the, the information of the lung regions will generate the cause information first, which, which is shown in the first line. And this uh, attention will hit the uh, whole lung regions. However, as we know that the infection region is not, not fully equals to the lung region, so this attention is a uh, cause attention. Therefore, we need to refine the attention by integrating the lung region and the infection regions together and get the uh, refine get the refined attentions after the collaboration in enhancement and get the final reason uh, get, and get the final attention used in the differentiations and uh, infection segmentations. And next, um, I will briefly introduce the loss functions using our pipeline um, in the in the very fast. Um, our loss functions uh, contains three parts. The first uh, classification loss, which is the multi-class cause endopy loss. And the second law is the uh, supervision loss for the lung regions, which is the binary cause endopy multi-scale loss. And the final loss, which is the most important loss, the infection loss is the combination loss of the binary cause endopy loss, the intersection over union loss, and the structural similarity measurement loss uh, in the multi-scale format. And then as to validate the performance of our work, uh, our framework, we make a uh, we design some experience and show some results. First of all, um, we follow the official di uh, di division of the data set and provide the provide the uh, data use in our experience and the data formats, which is shown in there. While the normal images and the non COVID nineteen infection images we have no COVID-19 infections, and why, but the networks also need this uh, mass as the, as the reference. So we need to add the blank infection mass to these two types of the images um, for the stable chaining of the uh, framework. And then this is some uh, experience details for our, uh, for our framework in the design and the experience. And then as um, the evaluation target of the experience include two things. The first is the differentiation of the COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 and the normal images. In this part, to consider the, uh, the uh, common sense of the, how to differentiate the COVID-19, um, we will use this pipeline to, as, the, as the step of how to differentiate the images. And the next part is the echo segmentation of the COVID-19 infections in the COVID-19 slice, and we will use the uh, metrics used in the uh, medical segmentations to evaluate the performance. And there's some uh, evaluation metrics in the differentiations, including the accuracy, the F1 score, the methyl coefficient, coefficient uh, metrics, and we present some uh, results of our differentiation uh, the co differentiate the COVID-19 slides from the uh, all slides, which is mixed with the COVID-19, non-COVID-19, and normal images. And we can see that our model outperform in the differentiations between the slides and with and without the COVID-19 infections. And then we also perform the evaluation in the segmentations using these metrics, including the dice coefficient, the intersection over union, the mean absolute errors and the saliency F score, which is widely used in the segmentation task. And then we also present the uh, segmentation results in the, in the set of the validation and testing. You can see that uh, compared with the other models, our model gets the best performance. And this, this best performance are also is six in the testing set, and which proves that our, our framework of design by integrating the lung region information together with the uh, segmentation and differentiation, get the uh, get the high efficiency. And to and to have uh, visualized results, we also show some segmentation results. And this segmentation result shows that um, our model could avoid the wrong segmentation of the infections, and also have a more accurate segment segmentation in the actual uh, infection regions. And the final part is the discussion and significance and future work while the COVID-19 has, has end. Um, first of all, um, 
our model has get the best performance in the idle sense when all inputs are with the COVID-19 infections, which is also the same assumption of the current deep learning algorithms. And, and the next part is that um, our, our model are also get the uh, good performance in the differentiation, which proves that the integration of the long, long user information could provide the more effective information for better differentiations and segmentations. Okay, and you will have uh, another problems uh, after the COVID-19 has, has gone, then if our models could only apply in the COVID-19, and the result is not, because um, we called our uh, in assumption that we will, we will use, uh, the infection regions are in the lung regions. This is an uh, assumption of our framework to, to apply. And we only use the COVID-19 data set as uh, examples. And for all the data which, which fulfill these requirements, they will also use our, our pipeline to apply in the, in the uh, differentiations and segmentation, the infected regions. And it even do not uh, limit it in the chest x-rays because um, we have already published this, uh, published this verse, and we also use the CT images, and this, this timeline is also work, and even get a more uh, better performance. Therefore, um, we will also have some future verse, uh, including the, um, the co um, while the COVID-19, uh, while the COVID-19 is gone, and then we have uh, some data, which, which only has the existence of the COVID-19. And with the support of the data, our, our, we want to develop our framework uh, to the multi-class uh, multi classification and segmentations, which could uh, differentiate more infected, like the uh, virus and the uh, bacteria phenomena. And we also, we also want to uh, develop a user, user-friendly a platform which which could use in the uh, uh, maybe the uh, server or the clusters for the more friendly use. While our framework currently is also the uh, deep learning deep learning in the deep learning platform and not apply to the uh, ensemble device. And um, okay, and that's all the contents of my presentations. And very thanks for your listening. And it's my appreciation for attending this. Uh, conference very fast. Thank you, Mr. He. Thank, thank you, our speaker. Because all of the uh, speakers can attend the live, um, because all the speaker can can't uh, attend the live Q and A sections today. Uh, sorry for um, no live Q and A sections. Uh, you, if you have uh, questions uh, about the talk, uh, please send to the uh, um, the uh, email uh, info i n f o dot hong kong l a at gmail dot com. Yeah, you will. Um, you may see it on the screen. Uh, for the um, you know the 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 blue ones. Okay, info dot Hong Kong RA at gmail dot com. I think you have so many questions about the new technologies. They are so amazing talks for uh, uh today. Okay, I will redirect the questions to the speaker respectively, and they will reply you accordingly. Okay. Uh. Uh, now, uh, can you, uh, the panelists can stay here and we want to take a, a, a good photo again because uh, now it's so many participants and the uh, panelists are here. Okay. Well, uh, are you ready to take a photos for us? Yes. Okay. Uh, could uh, all the panelists and uh, the um, uh, participants can uh, uh, open your camera now? Will, are you ready? No, stop share. Okay. Good. All the uh, attendees or participants can uh, open your camera. Yeah, Take this a is photo now. I'm yeah. ready now. Okay, we say hello. 
Are you ready? Okay, one, two, three, smile. Get it? Well, real? Uh, once again, once again. Oh, okay, once again, okay. We smile again. and... Three, okay, two, two, one, smile, smile, smile. Once more. Okay, okay. Thank you. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you of you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, like thank you for the wonderful presentation today. It's a really an interesting one on the whole body MRI and the COVID the research work is uh, very yeah, good. Yes. Fantastic. So, thank, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good yeah. to hear that details will get in touch soon. Thank you. Yeah, the, congratulations right. to the entire team and yeah. the speakers. Yeah, very good. You got the skull scan is a very uh, amazing uh, invitation uh, for the. Uh, innovation of the new now ultrasound yeah the new way for the ultrasound yeah thank you thank you okay uh, okay uh, uh we want to uh promote the next year isrt uh you can see the postcard in your notes uh before the end of the program i want to introduce the isrt will be how in Hong Kong in next year, but from 6th to 9th, June of 2024. The details can go through this uh, link. It's dub 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 isrrthk 2024org Okay. And we will send the information for all panelists with their email. Hope you can join us for the biggest radiographers congress over the world and enjoy the delicious food and see it in Hong Kong. Now we invite uh so nice to hear. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for the invitation, you, excellent to all. Yeah, hope, hope you can join us and see you in next year. Yeah, in Hong Kong. Sure, sure. We'll sure. try we'll Coming try to go. There. Hong Kong has hosted many times yeah i yeah. i have attended many times isrt congress in hong kong welcome mr chen i hope you so hopefully I hope i'll you save soon, yeah. enough money to go next year <laughs> yeah yeah okay um now uh we invite uh hong kong ra chairman mr uh nelson france for the closing speech yeah thank you okay. mr. and thank you all of you for joining us tonight and I sincerely hope you all have a wonderful and a fruitful lecture and I think you can see how smart we are right so um, I also want to let these opportunities to thank Mr. Marco Lam from the MLTA the VART for the organizing and technical support for this Asian CPD program and thank you very much and see you in the next event thank you Okay, thank you, thank Chairman. You. Thank yeah. you. Advanced congratulations to the entire team. It's mm -hmm. our pleasure to be there. Thank, thank you. you, Amy. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, before um, the end of the program, I want to introduce the next Asia CPT program, uh, which will be held by the Health Stand on 15th September 2023. Don't miss it and see you again. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Good night. Thank, Thank you, you HART, for a good night. Enjoy. Enjoy. Happy good Happy night. weekend yeah. to all. Okay. Okay. Bye. Good night to all. Night. Have a nice Sunday tomorrow. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Happy weekend. Good night. Same to you. Good night. Waiting bye to bye. come to Hong Kong during ISRT. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Welcome, yeah. Thank you, thank you.
Recording stopped.